Okay, welcome everybody. This is the chapter on the heart and cardiovascular function. So we're going to be talking about the blood pump that drives the blood through the circulatory system. And we'll discuss a little bit the regulation of blood pressure at the level of the heart. <coughs> so we're going to describe the structure of the pericardium and explain its function and ID the layers of the heart wall and describe their structures and function. And we'll also talk about the structure and function of cardiac muscle itself. We'll describe the location and general features of the heart, describe the major vessels that supply the heart and indicate where their locations are. We'll trace the flow of blood through the heart, identify the major blood vessels, the chambers, and the heart valves. And we'll define cardiac output and describe factors that influence heart rate and stroke volume. We'll explain the hormonal regulation of blood pressure and blood volume. And we'll identify the electrical events that are associated with an abnormal electrocardiogram, abbreviated ECG. So, where is the heart? The heart lies in the, thora in the thoracic cavity directly behind the sternum between the lungs in a region called the mediastinum. And the chamber inside the mediastinum in which the heart sits is called the pericardial chamber. It's slightly to the left of midline, as you can see in the diagram, rotated to the left. We define the base as the superior aspect of the heart where the great vessels attach, and the apex is the inferior portion, which is found near the fifth and sixth ribs. Note that it lies behind the sternum at the third costal cartilage, centered approximately a fraction, a centimeter and a fraction to the left of midline. The apex reaches the fifth intercostal space about 7.5 centimeters to the left of midline here. This is um, what you're feeling when you put your hand over your heart when you say the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay is that apex moving. It runs about 12.4 centimeters from the base to the apex and the apex has a nickname. Uh, we call it the point of maximum intensity or PMI. So the PMI. Okay, and that is right there. The superior border of the heart is formed by the base, while the right border is formed by the right atrium, and the left border is formed by the ventricle and part of the left atrium, with the inferior border formed by the inferior wall of the right ventricle. Now, you'll notice right away that we're talking about these features, the atria and the ventricles. Now, what are they? Well, the atria and the ventricles are simply uh, the chambers in the heart through which the blood flows. The two upper chambers are called the atria and they receive blood. The right atria receives blood from the body and the left atria receives blood from the lungs. While the ventricles are the two lower chambers here and here and they receive blood from the atria and eject it into the great vessels. The right ventricle ejecting it into the pulmonary trunk and the left ventricle ejecting it into the aorta. If we look at the wall of the heart, you have s several different layers that, again, meet the definition of an organ. More than one tissue doing something as a team that a single tissue could not do on its own. The epicardium, sometimes called the visceral pericardium, which is this layer right here, okay, is a serous membrane that covers the outer surface of the heart and is attached to the myocardium which is this thick middle layer which is made up primarily of cardiac muscle tissue. It also contains blood vessels and nerves. The inner layer, the part that actually comes into contact with the blood that the heart pumps, is called the endocardium. It's simple squamous epithelia with underlying areolar tissue and lines the inner surface of the heart including the valves. And from that standpoint it's very similar to the tunica intima of the blood vessels. It has the ability to repel the formed elements of blood 
and this cuts down on the potential for rupturing of the formed elements and the formation of clots. The pericardial sac surrounds the heart and it's formed by the parietal pericardium and is reinforced by an outer fibrous layer. The pericardial cavity is bound by two serous membranes, the visceral pericardium which actually clings to the heart and the parietal pericardium that forms the outer wall of the cavity and it contains pericardial fluid which helps to lubricate the heart as it pumps so that it doesn't irritate, inflame, and scar as it moves blood around the body. And this goes back to the very first chapter when we discussed the organs of the body and their location inside the various chambers of the body. We noted that the internal organs, by and large, have to have lubrication because as they move, they don't want to irritate and inflame because that would impede their function. And so, um, with very few exceptions, you find that most of the internal organs of the body are surrounded by a serous membrane that secretes a lubricating fluid that eases this movement. The atrial myocardium has a muscle that wraps around the atria and forms a figure eight encircling the large arteries and veins at the base of the heart, while the ventricular myocardium are superficial muscles that wrap around both ventricles the deeper layers spiral around and between the ventricles towards the apex in a figure eight pattern. And we should point out that there is a connective tissue skeleton that supports this musculature so that it can exert force on the blood that's in the chambers. In fact, when the heart beats, one of the things that we should note is that it has a sort of a ringing motion. It kind of spins a little bit on its axis. If we were to draw the axis of the heart here, we'll do blue, okay. If this this is the axis of the heart, we sort of rotate in a way similar to the way that this arrow kind of spins around the base of the heart. And this is why the PMI is so easily felt when you put your hand over your heart. Cardiac muscle tissue is one of the three types of muscle tissue. It's unique in that it's only found in the heart. It has a smaller cell size than skeletal muscle tissue. It's between 10 and 20 microns in diameter and 50 to 100 microns long. It has a single centrally located nucleus and many branching interconnections between the cells that feature specialized intercellular connections known as intercalated discs. Now the significance of these intercalated discs is that they contain gap junctions that allow easy movement of charged particles between cardiomyocytes and it also contains desmosomes which help to hold the heart together as it beats so that it doesn't come apart when it's pumping blood and that's unique in cardiac muscle tissue you don't see those kind of junctions in smooth muscle or in skeletal muscle cardiac muscle is only found in the heart and it contains myofibrils, similar to the way skeletal muscle contains myofibrils. The arrangement of filaments in the sarcomeres gives it a striated appearance similar to what we see in skeletal muscle. And it's dependent entirely on aerobic metabolism, so it has to have oxygen in order to function. It contains multiple mitochondria and lots of myoglobin, as well as extensive capillary supply because, again, this is energy-intensive activity, the pumping of blood around the body. We should also point out that the purpose of the myoglobin, as we saw in skeletal muscle tissue, it's also true in heart muscle tissue, it serves as an oxygen reserve. And this is so that in the event that there is a reduction in blood supply to the heart muscle, we have a sort of backup supply of oxygen in the event that we can't meet the heart muscle needs right away. Intercalated discs are the junctions between the cardiomyocytes. Plasma membranes of adjacent cardiac muscle cells intertwine and stabilize the position of adjacent cells. Gap junctions let ions and small molecules move from cell to cell. and This provides a direct electrical connection between the cells as a result, an action potential can travel across the intercalated disc from cell to cell, and as a result, 
the entire heart muscle in a way acts as a syncytion because the cytoplasms of all the cardiomyocytes are physically joined via the gap junctions. And this is what helps the heart to beat in a coordinated fashion when it squeezes blood. One of the things that we should note about heart muscle cells is that they have a property known as autorhythmicity, which means that if you were to take a heart muscle cell and look at it under a microscope and provide fuel and oxygen, it would it rhythmically squeeze. But all the heart muscle cells that you would be looking at wouldn't necessarily squeeze in the same rhythm. And in order for the heart to beat as a coordinated organ, one of the prerequisites is that we have to have this electrical connection between the cardiomyocytes so that the electrical signal that coordinates the heartbeat can move in a uniform fashion from where it's produced to where it's going to end up. And we'll see a little bit more of those details when we talk a little bit about the EKG later on. The desmosomes anchor the adjacent cells together and this allows the entire tissue to function as one enormous muscle cell. The mediastinum is the area between the two pleural cavities. The heart is found in the anterior portion surrounded by the pericardial sac. This region also contains blood vessels, the thymus, the esophagus, and the trachea. What you're looking at here is the orientation of the heart within the pericardial sac. The heart is suspended within the pericardial cavity. The boundaries of the internal chambers are visible on the external surface. An analogy for the heart in the pericardial cavity would be what we picture in the top there, a fist pushed into a partially inflated balloon where the fist would represent the heart. The wrist would be the base of the heart where the great vessels are attached. And the airspace inside the balloon would represent the pericardial cavity filled with pericardial fluid to lubricate the action of the heart as it beats. The pericardial cavity contains 15 to 50 milliliters of pericardial fluid that's secreted by the visceral pericardium to reduce the friction between the surfaces of the heart as it beats. Sometimes it can become infected, and this causes a condition known as pericarditis. An inflammation of the pericardial surfaces produces a scratching sound when we listen to it through the stethoscope, and it's quite painful. This is the front of the heart with the pericardial sac removed. The interior surface view features the right and left atria, which are thin walled and expandable like balloons. There, at the top, you can see the right atrium. There's a little bit of the left atrium. They form these little flaps that we call auricles, which are the expandable portion of the atria. The sulci are shallow grooves that mark the boundaries between the chambers. You can see here the coronary sulcus, for instance, which marks the border between the atria and the ventricles. They often have adipose tissue accumulated in these regions, and that's to pad and protect the organ. The anterior interventricular sulcus marks the boundary between the right and the left ventricles, while the ligamentum arteriosum attaches the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. And we'll find out when we get to the chapter on human development that this is a remnant of a vessel called the ductus arteriosus, which in the fetal circulation connects the aortic arch to the pulmonary trunk due to the fact that while you're in your mother's womb, you can only get oxygen via the placenta. And so we have to have some way of getting oxygenated blood from the placenta to the rest of the organs. And this bypass, along with a few other modifications of the fetal circulation, allow that to happen. Once you're out of the birth canal, you can breathe on your own, and those pressure changes actually cause those fetal structures to collapse and restore the normal flow of blood through the circulatory system. The posterior surface of the heart shows the left atrium and its connection to the pulmonary veins, and the right atrium and its connection to the coronary veins and the vena cava. The coronary sinus is a large blood-filled area on the back of the heart that carries blood collected from the myocardium into the right atrium. So the right atrium, as we're going to find out, actually receives blood from the superior and inferior vena cava, but also from the coronary sinus. The posterior interventricular sulcus marks the boundary between the right and the left ventricles, and you can see that down here. The heart gets first dibs on the blood that it pumps 
the right and left coronary arteries actually come off the base of the aorta and supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself. During exertion, blood flow can increase to nine times resting levels. The coronary arteries provide this badly needed blood when the heart is engaged in an increased rate of pumping. This peaks when the heart muscle is relaxed. And the reason for this is that when the heart muscle goes into what's called diastole, where the chambers open up a bit, the blood actually flows backwards towards the valves that open into the great vessels, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And in the case of the aorta, the oxygenated blood then fills the coronary arteries and perfuses the heart muscle. It almost ceases when the heart muscle contracts. So the heart is getting its primary blood supply when the heart muscle itself is relaxed. The left coronary artery supplies the left ventricle, the left atrium, and interventricular septum. The circumflex artery curves around the coronary sulcus and meets with branches from the right coronary artery, while the anterior interventricular artery is within the anterior interventricular sulcus. The right coronary artery follows the coronary sulcus around supplying the right atrium and parts of both ventricles. The marginal arteries supply the surface of the right ventricle, while the posterior interventricular artery within the posterior interventricular sulcus supplies the interventricular sulcus and adjacent parts of the ventricles. The arterial anastomoses between the anterior and posterior interventricular arteries are important because they ensure a constant flow of blood to the organ in the event that we have a, a blockage. They're not foolproof, but you'll find in places like the brain and the heart that this is a feature that helps to maintain a constant flow of oxygenated blood to keep the organ functioning. You can see here the blood vessels that supply the heart, the marginal arteries here, right, that branch off the right coronary, the circumflex artery that branches off the left coronary and also gives rise to the anterior interventricular. And then wrapping around the back, you can see the marginal arteries, the right coronary artery, and you can also pick up a bit of the circumflex artery, which is going to wrap around coming off of the left coronary artery um, and supply blood to the back portion of the heart. Okay. So again, to orient yourself, the circumflex artery would be winding around here. Okay. The anterior surface of the heart features cardiac veins that drain the anterior surface of the right ventricle and empty into the right atrium. The great cardiac vein flows along the anterior interventricular sulcus and curves around the coronary sulcus emptying into the coronary sinus, which in turn is going to empty into the right atrium. The posterior surface includes the coronary sinus, which is expanded portion of the drainage from the heart muscle that opens into the right atrium. The posterior cardiac vein drains areas supplied by the circumflex artery, while the small cardiac vein drains the posterior surfaces of the right atrium and the ventricle. This empties into the coronary sinus along with the middle cardiac vein. Okay, now the aorta is one of the great vessels attached to the base of the heart. It's the main artery that comes out of the left ventricle and eventually branches extensively to supply blood to every tissue in the body with the exception, of course, of the blood supply to the lungs where the oxygen is picked up. Contraction of the left ventricle forces blood into the aorta and stretches its elastic walls, and if it didn't have the ability to compensate for this increased force, the great vessel would easily rupture. So the fact that it can stretch is important because that aids it in its function. The relaxation of the left ventricle causes the pressure in the aorta to drop, the walls of the aorta recoil, 
and then call this elastic rebound, which pushes blood forward into the systemic circuit and pushes blood backward into the coronary arteries. Remember that the heart muscle itself actually gets the bulk of its blood supply when all four chambers are in diastole because that's when the blood flows back towards the heart. It will not re-enter the ventricular chambers and the reason for that is because of the geometry of the semilunar valves. It does not permit them to open into the ventricles, only open out of the ventricles. Blood flows from the atria into the ventricles. The interatrial septum divides the two atria while the interventricular septum separates the two ventricles and the atrioventricular valves lie between the atria and the ventricles themselves. Now, on the right side of the heart, the atrioventricular valve is called the tricuspid valve. Let's write that down. And we'll write it in blue because this is uh, deoxygenated blood that flows through this. So on the right side, it's the tricuspid. And it gets that name because it has three flaps or cusps. And on the left side, it's called the bicuspid or mitral valve. So it has two flaps. It gets the name not mitral valve because it looks a little bit like a bishop's mitre. Mitral valve. Okay. And these open only open into the ventricles. These allow blood to flow in one direction from the atria into the ventricles. Um, in the event that they're not working properly, we can call that a prolapse. So that would be where um, one of the valves is not performing the way it's supposed to. Prolapse. It'd be a defective valve. And you can pick this up when you listen to the heartbeat as a gurgling or a, or a whooshing sound. <clears throat> the right atrium receives deoxygenated blood from the superior and inferior vena cava in the coronary sinus. The fossa ovalis is the former location of the foramen ovale in the embryo that used to be a bypass from the right atrium to the left atrium, but this closes up um, at birth. The pectinate muscles form the muscular ridges in the anterior atrial wall and the inner surface of the auricle. And in the left atrium, we receive oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins. And so we can see immediately, if we sort of kind of keep this in our head, that the right side of the heart And these would be represent the four chambers. And it's, no, it's not anatomically perfect, but it's sort of a schematic diagram. But this would be the right side of the heart. This would be the left side of the heart. And in the right side of the heart, we always have deoxygenated blood. So we'll indicate that by coloring this side blue. And in the left side of the heart, we always have oxygenated blood. And the reason for that is that it picks up oxygen in the lungs, and as it returns back to the left side of the heart from the lungs, the oxygen content is significantly higher. Okay, So the right side and the left side of the heart. The right ventricle receives blood from the right atrium through the right atrioventricular or tricuspid valve. The free edge of the valve has three cusps that are attached to connective tissue called chordae tendinae, nicknamed the heart strings. And the purpose of the chordae tendinae is to stabilize the position of the cusps, but also to help prevent prolapse. The chordae tendinae originate at the papillary muscles, which are conical muscular projections. With contraction, blood exits through the pulmonary valve, 
and it has three flaps. So these three flaps um, open out of the right ventricle and into the pulmonary trunk. And this is how we ensure one-way flow of blood on this side of the heart. The moderator band tenses the papillary muscles just before contraction and this prevents the slamming of the AV valve cusps and it also helps again to keep the the valves open in order for the blood to be ejected from the atria into the ventricles. The left ventricle is the strongest of all four chambers of the heart because it has to pump blood throughout the body so it has the thickest wall. It produces more pressure to push blood through the larger systemic circuit. It receives blood from the left atrium through the mitral valve also called the bicuspid valve or left AV valve. It has only two flaps compared to the tricuspid on the right side of the heart which has three. With contraction, blood exits through the aortic semilunar valve and into the ascending aorta. The trabeculae carniae are muscular ridges on the inner surface of the right and left ventricles. So let's take a listen to the heart anatomy. The heart is a muscular pump that works continuously to circulate blood through the cardiovascular system. Blood carries oxygen, nutrients, hormones, waste, and other substances to and from cells of the body. The heart pumps our five liters of blood through the body nearly 1,400 times per day, every day of our lives. The human heart is divided into four chambers, two upper chambers, called the atria, and two lower chambers, the ventricles. Near the base of the heart, blood vessels connect to each chamber. Blood enters the heart through the large veins, which empty into the thin-walled atria. Blood leaves the ventricles in large arteries, which carry blood away from the heart. You can think of the heart as two separate pumps operating side by side within one organ. A thin interatrial septum separates the two atria, and a thick interventricular septum separates the two ventricles. On the right side, blood enters the right atrium, then travels to the right ventricle. The right ventricle then pumps the blood through the pulmonary circuit and back into the left side of the heart. On the left side, blood enters the left atrium, then travels to the left ventricle. The left ventricle then pumps the blood through the systemic circuit and back into the right side of the heart. When the heart beats, it propels blood simultaneously through these two circuits. In this design, blood flow is unidirectional, that is, it flows in one direction only, first through one circuit, then through the next, and back again to the first. Okay, what you're looking at here is the front of the heart with the front half cut away to show you the path of blood through the heart. Note that it's the valves that ensure the one-way flow of blood. The atrioventricular valves opening from the atria into the ventricles ensure that blood only runs from the upper to the lower chambers and the semilunar valves in the right ventricle, that's the pulmonary semilunar, and in the left ventricle that's the aortic semilunar, ensure that when blood leaves the lower chambers it only flows out of the lower chambers and never back in. Again, provided that there is no sort of disease process or trauma that impedes the function of these valve flaps. So you can see here we can trace it relatively easily. Let's do um, blue on the right side so you can see the blood coming in. So notice you can kind of follow the arrows here but the blood is going to come in from the inferior vena cava and enter the right atrium here and it's going to come in from the superior vena cava and enter the right atrium here and it's also going to come in through remember the coronary sinus so there's going to be a little teeny tiny hole up here and some blood will come in 
drained from the heart muscle itself. Now, where does the blood go next? The blood's going to go from the right atrium into the right ventricle, through the tricuspid valve, and then it's going to flow from the right ventricle through the pulmonary semilunar valve, this little guy right here, and into the pulmonary trunk, where it's going to head now to the pulmonary arteries, and this will take it all the way to the lungs, where it'll pick up oxygen. Now, when we pick up oxygen, the blood's going to turn from a dark to a bright red, and it will return to the left atrium. So you have to imagine here that there's there's a lung over here, okay, and a lung over here, and the blood returns from the lungs, and I'll kind of duck under this little placard here, enters the pulmonary veins, and then we end up in the left atrium. There's two pulmonary veins on the left and two pulmonary veins on the right. Okay, and you can see here pulmonary veins coming in. It's kind of tough to see. We can just sort of draw uh, the path that it might take. Right, pulmonary veins emptying into here. Okay, so you got your three dimensions. Now, where does the blood go next? It's going to go from the left atrium through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle it's going to be sent through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta and from there we're going to go throughout the body. Okay, This is the biggest artery in the body, the aorta. Okay, Now, one of the things that you have to be very careful about here is that I've given you the impression that the, the way that the heart sends the blood through its four chambers is squeeze, squeeze, and then squeeze, squeeze. And in point of fact, when the heart beats, the two upper chambers squeeze in synchrony first together, and that dumps the blood into the two lower chambers, and then the two lower chambers will squeeze and eject the blood into their great vessels. So there's always fluid in all four chambers of the heart. It's just that the amount of fluid varies depending on whether the chamber is squeezing, and we say that the chamber is in systole when it's squeezing, or whether it's relaxing, and there's a lot of blood in the chamber, and we call that condition diastole. Okay, So it's first the two upper chambers squeezing, and then the two lower chambers squeezing. So squeeze, 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 squeeze. Okay, If there were ever a condition in which one of the four chambers of the heart had no fluid in it, the heart would likely seize up and quit pumping. In fact, it's a good way to kill somebody is to try and put a large air bubble into, say, the vena cava, and when the heart receives that, that jolt of having no fluid, it'll lock up and quit pumping. So you have to keep all four chambers primed. The chordae tendinae are attached to the atrioventricular valves. They're loose when the AV valves are open, allowing blood to flow from the atria into the ventricles. The pressure in the pulmonary and the systemic circuits keeps the aortic and the pulmonary valves closed at this point, and the blood flows into the coronary arteries, originating at the aortic sinuses which are adjacent to the cusps of the aortic valve. Okay, So you have to remember here that you're looking at the base of the heart with the two upper chambers removed. So you can see here the atrioventricular valves. There's the bicuspid, there's the tricuspid. And here you can see the aortic and the pulmonary semilunar valves, which are the doorways out of the heart. Okay, And what you're looking at here is just sort of a, a, a cross-section showing you how the geometry of these valves permits the one-way flow of blood. The atrioventricular valves only open into the ventricles, and the semilunar valves only open out of the ventricles. So the semilunar valves are the doorway out, the atrioventricular valves are the doorway in. Now what will happen 
eventually as the ventricles begin to squeeze is that the pressure will become high enough in the lower chambers of the heart to open the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves and eject the blood into the aorta and into the pulmonary trunk and that point is reached when the pressure in the two lower chambers is greater than the back pressure of the blood lying on top of the semilunar valves. And this is one of the reasons why in individuals who are out of shape the heart has to work extra hard to pump blood around the body. The blood vessels in an individual who has a lot of carrying a lot of bad weight are longer than they would normally be and that produces more resistance meaning that the heart has to work harder against that back pressure to open those semilunar valves and to pump blood throughout the body and so in a lot of these people what we see is hypertension and we call also see often cardiac hypertrophy where um, the heart muscle itself actually enlarges because it has to do so much extra work and the danger there of course is that the heart could fail over time when the ventricles are contracted blood is moving towards the blood moving towards the atria pushes the cusps of the AV valves together and this closes the AV valves and the papillary muscles contract tensing the chordae tendinae preventing prolapse of the cusps into the atria the increasing ventricular pressure pushes open the aortic and pulmonary valves which are also known as the semilunars due to their half moon shape and that allows the blood then to escape. So what you're looking at here again is what we would call um, the the ejection phase of the cardiac cycle. Here we are increasing the amount of pressure that the blood exerts on the walls of the ventricles because the ventricles are squeezing. This causes the AV valves to slap shut and then once we overcome the back pressure on the semilunars we're able to open both of those and send blood in the case of the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk and then into the pulmonary arteries towards the lungs and in the case of the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta and out to the entire body. So let's take a listen at uh, this little video on the heart valves. Some heart functions can be assessed from the outside of the body. For example, the loudest heart sounds heard during a physical examination are the sounds of heart valves closing. There are four valves of the heart, one in each chamber. Located at the point where blood leaves the chamber, each is a membranous flap that serves to prevent backflow of blood. Valves are thus essential in keeping blood flow unidirectional through the heart. Atrioventricular or AV valves are located between the atria and the ventricles and prevent backward flow of blood from the ventricles into the atria. Semilunar valves are located at the point where blood leaves the ventricles, preventing backflow of blood into these chambers. On the right side of the heart, a semilunar valve separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk. And on the left side, a semilunar valve separates the left ventricle and the aorta. Note that blood flows from the ventricles into the pulmonary trunk and the aorta uh, when the ventricles are contracted. And again, this is provided that we've overcome the back pressure that we see in the great vessels. There's two basic phases of the cardiac cycle. The contraction phase is called systole and in this phase blood is pushed into the adjacent chamber or arterial trunk. Relaxation is termed diastole where the chamber fills with blood. And So there's kind of sort of draw aspect to this and so you can see here the different phases of the cardiac cycle beginning with the atria filling with blood then we see the atrial systole then we see ventricular systole and then we have ventricular diastole and then we go back again okay so what you're looking at here 
is what's going on in the lower chambers and over here you're looking at what's going on in the upper chambers. In the upper chambers atrial systole and atrial diastole right and here in the lower chambers we start at the end of atrial systole with ventricular systole and atrial diastole and then we go into ventricular systole while the atria are still relaxed and drawing blood and then the whole process starts all over again okay so there's going to be a point at which all four chambers are in the relaxed phase okay that would be where atrial and ventricular diastole correspond all right and that would be this portion of the cardiac cycle and then we start all over again with what with the atria contracting and beginning the cycle anew once they've already filled with blood okay so relaxation then contraction then relaxation all over again now you could get by without any atrial action at all um, if the atria for some reason were to quit functioning blood would still fall from the upper to the lower chambers sufficiently enough driven by gravity and also by the draw produced by ventricular diastole in order to maintain blood flow throughout the body and so sometimes this happens in individuals that have a condition called atrial fibrillation so call this AFib for short AFib and AFib isn't good but it's not lethal most of the time whereas VFib where the two lower chambers quit pumping is life-threatening okay and the reason for that is that if the two lower chambers are not squeezing we're not sending blood to the lungs for oxygenation and we're also not sending blood throughout the body to supply the tissues with oxygen and nutrients both atria contract first and this pushes blood into the ventricles atrial systole is what we call that stage the ventricles are relaxed at this point so we call that ventricular diastole and so you can see this portion of the cardiac cycle here right atrial systole ventricular diastole then both ventricles contract and this pushes blood through the pulmonary and systemic circuits while at the same time shutting both of the atrioventricular valves and again once the pressure is high enough the semilunar valves will open and the ejecting chambers the ventricles will send the blood to the appropriate location the right ventricle to the lungs ultimately and the left ventricle to the body so we call this phase ventricular systole. At this point, the atria are in diastole, and eventually what will happen after the ventricles have ejected their fraction is all four chambers of the heart will go back to being in diastole. Okay. Cardiac output is the product of the stroke volume and the heart rate. Okay. Stroke volume is the amount of fluid that the heart squeezes out with each beat, specifically here the ventricles. And the heart rate is the number of beats per minute. Okay, so we can determine the stroke volume in terms of milliliters or liters, and we can, can, turn, can determine the heart rate as a number of beats per minute. It depends on the heart rate and the stroke volume. And so we could compute this if we were to give an example, okay? The cardiac output is calculated as the product of these two quantities. The body can adjust the cardiac output to meet needs, such as when you exercise, you have to pump more blood around the body because the heart and the lungs require more blood in order to get more oxygen into the blood. The muscles require more blood and so we have to increase the cardiac output to maintain the activity. The heart rate can increase by 250% over its resting output 
and you see that sometimes when people are exercising or when people are panicking. The stroke volume can double and the result is a dramatic increase in the amount of blood that can be pumped. Heart failure occurs when the heart cannot meet the demands of the peripheral tissues. So we're not getting the oxygen and the nutrients to the body quick enough in order to sustain the activity. So here we can see a little math, right? There's the resting heart rate, 75 beats per minute. The stroke volume, about 80 milliliters per beat. And when we multiply those through, we get about 6 liters a minute at rest, okay? But check it out. Um, if, we, if we take an exercise example, um, the stroke volume here, it says, can double. So let's, uh, let's run the numbers. If we do that, that would be, let's say we're doing big-time exercise, 160 milliliters per beat. Okay, and then over here, the heart rate can increase by 250%, okay? Well, 2 times 75 is going to be 150, right? So that's 200%. And then another 50% of 75 would be 35 plus 2.5, so 37.5. So call it... Um, Call it 190 beats per minute. So we add like 40 beats per minute. That comes about 190 BPM. And so if you run those numbers, right, 190 times 160... Um, go ahead and quickly crank that out. That comes to approximately 30 liters per minute. So that's just a, a shining example of how much the body can increase the cardiac output. 30 liters, which would be 30,000 milliliters, but just 30 liters for fun. Okay? And that's per minute. So that's pretty dramatic. Pretty dramatic. So here you can see an example of the range of cardiac outputs here. Um, there's your average resting cardiac output. And then as we start to kick up our exercise routine, there's our 30 liters per minute. We can even go further than that for trained athletes exercising at peak levels. We can kick this up to 40 liters per minute. And the reason for this, again, is that in a trained athlete, there's less resistance on the heart. As a result, the heart doesn't have to work as hard to send the blood around the body. The result is that the, the stroke volume goes up dramatically and with the resistance going down um, we can increase the heart rate while not putting a huge burden on the heart because it's easier to pump the blood around the body because there's more places for the blood to go because there's literally more blood vessels in an individual who's <clears throat> got a lot of lean muscle mass. So what are some factors that affect heart rate? Well the nervous system has a major role. Sympathetic stimulation is going to increase the heart rate, while parasympathetic stimulation will decrease the heart rate. And remember, these are both branches of the autonomic nervous system. Body temperature has a role as well. Increased body temperature increases the heart rate, while the reverse is seen with a decrease in temperature. Hormonal regulation has a role as well. We see an increased heart rate when we see an increase in the production of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla and thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland. Factors that affect stroke volume are many and varied. The venous return is the amount of venous blood 
delivered to the heart by the systemic circulation per minute. It's influenced by blood volume, muscular activity, and the rate of blood flow through the peripheral capillaries. The filling time is the duration of ventricular diastole. <clears throat> Longer filling time means there's more blood in the ventricles. More blood in the ventricles increases the stroke volume, and we call this Starling's Law of the Heart, which means that the more blood you throw into the chamber, the more powerfully the chamber is going to squeeze in order to eject that increased amount of blood. Increased venous return thus increases stroke volume, while decreased venous return will decrease stroke volume. Now, why is it that the stroke volume goes up so much um, as a result of venous return when you exercise? And that's because you're using your muscles, and when you use your muscles and you move more, you send more blood back to the heart. The more blood you send to the heart, the more blood the heart can send out to the body. Contractility is the amount of force that's produced by ventricular contraction. Neural regulation has a major role in this. It's basically the amount of squeeze that the heart puts on the blood that it contains. Neural regulation via sympathetic stimulation will increase contractility, while parasympathetic stimulation has a minimal effect on ventricular contractility. Hormonal regulation has a role as well. Epinephrine and norepinephrine and thyroxine and T3 will increase contractility. And there are a lot of meds that are designed to reduce contractility. Okay, so we use those, for instance, in the treatment of hypertension. And here we can see an overview of the factors that affect heart rate and stroke volume. These adjustments in heart rate and stroke volume regulate the cardiac output in order to meet the needs of the body as our activity levels change or as our metabolic needs change. If we don't do this, then we're not going to deliver enough oxygen and nutrients to the tissues to keep them viable. Here we can see an example of how the endocrine system responds to low blood pressure and low blood volume. Short-term responses include the adrenal medulla releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine, which stimulates cardiac output and peripheral vasoconstriction and increases blood pressure. Long-term regulation involves angiotensin II, an antidiuretic hormone, as well as angiotensin-converting enzyme, and erythropoietin, and aldosterone, and all these increase blood volume and blood pressure. Now, exactly how does this happen? Well, there's a hormonal axis that's fairly important to know, which is called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. Okay. Um, and it's abbreviated RAA. Now how does it work? Well, what happens initially is that we sense a decrease in blood pressure and this happens generally at the level of the kidneys. Okay, and The kidneys as a result will increase their production of renin. So kidneys Kidneys kick out the renin, which is a protein, and renin will convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And where is angiotensinogen? It's just in the blood all the time. In the lungs, what will happen is that angiotensin converting enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Okay, and that's done by ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. And what does angiotensin 2 do? Well, it has a, a forked effect. Okay, it increases ADH production. and it also increases aldosterone production. Now what do these do? Well these act on the kidneys. The ADH causes us to retain water and the aldosterone also causes us to retain water 
They do it by slightly different mechanisms, but the point is that that water that's retained increases the blood volume and as a result increases the blood pressure. And so one of the ways that we manage hypertension is to deal with some of these factors that tend to elevate blood pressure. You've probably heard of people using ACE inhibitors to control their blood pressure. It cuts down on the production of angiotensin II. It cuts down on ADH and aldosterone production. That cuts down on blood volume and as a result cuts down on blood pressure. Another way that we can regulate uh, blood pressure using medications um, is to use um, diuretics and these are drugs that essentially cause you to urinate as you lose blood volume you lose blood pressure and the result then is that the hypertension is ameliorated and then finally we can use medications that um, slow down the heart rate we call these negative chronotropic reagents they decrease the rate and the force of contraction of the heart and the result is that the blood pressure goes down as well so you can see in people who are hypertensive we can do any combination of those mechanisms in order to try and keep the high blood pressure down as much as possible okay. and so on the flip side um, when the blood pressure is getting too high we need to take action to decrease the blood pressure again why do we have to keep blood pressure within this tight window if blood pressure gets way too low we're not going to get enough blood to the tissues to keep them viable and you'll die if the blood pressure gets too high you're going to rupture the capillaries and the result is going to be a reduction in blood supply to downstream tissues and they will also die you'll also see increased risk of heart attack and stroke so in the increased blood pressure scenario increased volume or pressure stretches the heart walls and in response cardiac muscle cells of the wall of the right atrium release a protein called atrial natriuretic peptide which reduces blood volume and blood pressure by causing us to excrete sodium this decreased blood volume and pressure reduces the stress on the heart in response once that happens atrial natriuretic production stops okay so this is a hormone ANP that's designed to reduce blood pressure overall. Other things that you'll see will be a reduction in the rate and the force of contraction of the heart at the same time. Okay, In addition to these endocrine responses that are designed to reduce the blood pressure overall. An electrocardiogram is simply the electrical activity of the heart recorded using an instrument that has electrodes which are positioned around the chest to record the amplitude the direction and the speed of electrical currents that move through the heart muscle so we call this an ECG or EKG two names for the same thing it's used to assess contractile function and can reveal damage from a heart attack as well so a typical EKG has the following waveforms they go in alphabetical order they are the P wave which represents depolarization of the atria the QRS complex that shows depolarization of the ventricles and the T wave which shows ventricular repolarization now there's a couple of intervals we should take note of the PR interval if it's longer than 200 milliseconds indicates damage to the AV node and the QT interval is the time for the ventricles to complete the cycle of depolarization and repolarization so the way I've always taught my students to remember this is to kinda of think of it like an old high school cheer okay think of it this way depolarize squeeze repolarize relax okay and when we say squeeze what we mean is systole 
and when we say relax we mean diastole okay so let's go through the, the sequence of electrical events we have to understand that if we if we draw a picture of the heart okay that there's a wiring in the heart that's very important to know so let's draw kind of a big heart here so we can see this okay these would be the four chambers and let's do the the wiring in, in uh, green here so the pacemaker of the heart is called the SA node and it's it's up here okay the AV node receives the signal from the SA node the bundle of Hiss is in the interventricular septum and it sends the electrical signal to the right and left bundle branches down here and that sends the signal to these cells that are called Purkinje fibers and then the whole thing starts all over again so essentially what happens is that the signal will be set by the SA node be captured by the AV node where it will rest for a short period of time to give the blood a chance to fall from the atrium to the ventricles and then very rapidly will shoot down the interventricular septum up the walls of the ventricles and then they will squeeze okay so if we look at what's going on here the P wave is the depolarization of the atria after the P wave moves through the atria the atria will squeeze Okay, so depolarization represented by the P wave and then squeezing of the atria which would be right here so let's just say in this region here is atrial systole okay then what happens is that the AV node captures the signal and it rests there for a short time as the blood fills the lower chambers then it sends the signal very rapidly down the bundle of Hiss and the right and left bundle branches resulting in this little spiky thing called the QRS complex which represents an increase in the speed of the signal and also a change in the signal's direction the speed of the signal is indicated by the spikiness of the wave and the amplitude of the signal by the height of the wave and the direction of the signal of course by the direction of the wave okay and so what happens after that occurs is that it radiates up the Purkinje fibers okay and that is followed by ventricular systole so here in this little flat area is ventricular systole and then the last thing to happen is that the ventricles will repolarize and then the ventricles will go into diastole. Okay, so this represents ventricular repolarization. And then over here, let's do this in a different color. Do this in uh, cyan. This would be ventricular diastole. And then the whole thing starts all over again. So the heart would beat even if it had no nerve leads whatsoever. But depending on the information that it gets from the autonomic nervous system, it can either pick up the pace or it can slow down. Sympathetic system will speed it up. The parasympathetic system will slow it down. But it would beat even if it didn't have any input from those systems. Okay. So depolarize, systole, repolarize, relax, depolarize, systole, repolarize, relax, first for the upper chambers and then for the lower chambers. Okay. There are some abnormal EKGs that we should be aware of. Cardiac arrhythmias are abnormal patterns of electrical activity in the heart. One example are premature atrial contractions or PACs, which we may see in a healthy person. It increases with stress and caffeine and some drugs that increase the membrane permeability of SA pacemakers. Paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, or PAT, are a flurry of atrial activity 
that are triggered by PACs. The ventricles keep pace and this can increase the heart rate up to 180 beats per minute. Okay, so you can see that in this trace up here. Okay. Atrial fibrillation is an impulse moving at about 500 beats per minute that produces an atrial quivering. The ventricular rate often remains normal, so the condition can frequently go unnoticed in a healthy individual. And again, AFib is not life-threatening. V-fib, though, is a different story. Premature ventricular contraction is where the ventricles squeeze before they're completely filled with blood. The cell triggering the contraction is often what we call an ectopic pacemaker. It's a piece of electrical tissue that's operating outside the normal wiring of the heart and causing these premature contractions. Single PVCs are common and not dangerous. Increased frequency can be seen with epinephrine, caffeine, ionic changes that depolarize the cell membranes, and other conditions. Ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC, is four or more premature ventricular contractions without intervening normal beats. You can see that down here. It's a serious cardiac problem. And then finally, VFib is responsible for cardiac arrest. This is rapidly fatal since the ventricles are quivering and they are not pumping. Okay. Now what follows is going to be a, a very short film loop that shows you an EKG, the electrical events in the heart, and the mechanical events in the heart. I'll run it three or four cycles for you so you get an idea how these, all these different things sort of come together to coordinate the heartbeat. And with that, I'll see everybody in the next podcast. Thank you for listening.